if you can be here, being aware of life and death at the same time. Because both are here at the same time. They are not two separate things. That's all it is, that fragile, but at the same time so sturdy. These are one inside the other, life is all packed like this, creation and the creator, life and death, everything packed one inside the other. It takes uh, attention, it takes a lot of attention if one has to see what it is. Otherwise, one just lives on the surface, half alive. If you do not know life and death at the same time, you know only one half of life. Being half alive is torture, always. So when we say Shiva, we are uttering this so that this dimension of life and death being together at the same time happens to you. That the polarities are gone. There is no life and death. There is just this. For this, there is no na name yet. Because if you give it a name, somebody will invent the opposite. It's just this. But there is that. There is no that, there is just this. There is no this and that, there is just this and this. There is no yes and no, there is just yes and yes. If you want to see, every aspect of life has this. If you want to fall in love, if you are in love, love does not need polarities, love does not need an opposite. Because for most people love starts in their heart and sinks into their genital, an opposite is needed. For sexuality you need the opposite, for love you don't need the opposite. What you thought is you and something has become just this, for example, on many levels. Starting in the yogic terminology, if you want to look at it, starting from the Muladhara, where it is about food and sleep, there is that and this. If you eat it, everything becomes this. Now, you are mentally alert, you are looking at things, there is you and the other. If you fall asleep, that is just this. There is no this and that. So this is on all levels. If it happens in the lowest chakra, low is not the word. When I say low, we are not talking high and low, we are talking geographically, southern chakra. <clears throat> when it happens at the Muladhara, it happens as food and sleep, but the same unity. If it happens at Swadhisthana, it happens as sexuality, but the same unity. If it happens at Manipuraka, it finds expression as ambition, greed, conquest, but the same thing. If it happens at Anahata, it happens as love, but the same thing. But now, from Moladhara to Anahata, you have natural access. You are naturally capable of these things. Even a child is capable of this, even a dog is capable of this. He can ingest, digest and assimilate. He has his sexuality. We have already looked at this, looked at this, dogs are loving for sure. We don't know about God, 
we are not so sure about the human beings, but dogs we are dead certain. Yes? Yes or no? Mm -hmm. There is no question about dog's love. God's love, we don't know. Man's love, woman's love, we're not sure. Sometimes it looks real, sometimes we don't know. <laughs> dog's love, that's certain we are. <clears throat> so from Muladhara to Anahata, it's open to every creature actually. This comes naturally, this is a gift from nature. But if you want to go beyond this, if you want to know the union that the Vishuddhi brings about, the union that the Agna brings about, the highest possible union that can happen at Sahasra, this will not happen unless you strive for it. If you want to live here, as just another creature on this planet, nothing wrong, there's absolutely nothing wrong. When I say a cow, a dog, an elephant, a snake, I am not speaking in any derogatory term. I know, it's a very derogatory thing to say you're a dog. I don't know why. They are more steady, more people trust dogs than human beings. And the numbers are increasing by the day. But still a dog is a derogatory term for some reason. So I am not speaking of these creatures as in any derogatory sense, but limited for sure, isn't it? The possibilities of life are limited in these forms. We are just talking about boundaries because the basic concern of a human being is to go beyond his boundaries always. So if you want to go beyond these four levels of union that one can know, then it needs a little more awareness, a little more devotion, a little more push. If your energies rise, if you become aware or if you experience the union in your Vishuddhi, you will become stupidly devotional. I'm saying stupidly devotional not because devotion is stupid, but generally devotees are perceived as idiots by the well-educated world <laughs> because they don't stand to their reason. Anything that does not agree with your way of reasoning seems stupid to you. But it doesn't matter how stupid you think they are, they're experiencing lot more pleasantness than you do. Maybe they're not so stupid at all. <laughs> it is just that they have moved their life from simple one plus one equals two to a different kind of arithmetic within themselves. Where there is no plus or minus, it's just one, always one. <laughs> you must understand, without one, there is no number system. Just always one. If you know union on the level of your Vishuddhi, this is what happens, tremendous sense of power because this union is a different kind. If the union is on the level of Agna, then this brings absolute awareness and knowing. Now, once someone has attained union on the level of Agna, 
Suddenly, the intellectual types look stupid in front of him. You've heard of Adi Shankara. This is the most argumentative Indian ever. He went about walking across the land looking for arguments, such unbeatable logic. People were defeated and defeated and defeated in hordes. All kinds of people came to argue with him. Whoever argued with him, they're bound to lose because there is nobody else with that kind of logic because a certain union that you have experienced in the Agna gives you a completely different kind of logic. If your energies, if you find union at your Sahasrar, you're ecstatic beyond anything that you know. Shankara used to be like this, he was so argumentative and defeating people all the time in his arguments, every day picking up arguments with all kinds of people. But suddenly he would go into a temple and weep and dance like a madman. People would be shocked. We thought you were a man of reason. What are you crying? Like this. Like those buffoons who call themselves devotees, like them you're crying? We thought you were a man of true intellect. He would say, that's for the world, my logic is for the world, this is for me. So this is a simple step one needs to take. In your awareness, if life and death are at the same time, if they are not two separate things, then you have set the fundamentals for the highest union possible. You got the right foundation. You want to live, you don't want to die you are on a very wrong foundation. You are on an extremely wrong foundation. The more you build on this wrong foundation, the more you are asking for a disaster. Suppose we made a mistake with the foundation, the best is to build a minimum possible building, isn't it? Hmm? Suppose we have done a mistake with the foundation work, even in a construction site, the best thing is to build a minimum possible building. The more you build, the more you're putting yourself to risk. That is why they talked so much about renunciation. Because they said, you got a wrong foundation, don't build too much. The more you build, further away from truth you will go, keep it minimum. Because the foundation is wrong, till you fix that, don't build too much.